Hi, my name is Tyler Town, and this is The Review. On this show, our host will take you to attractions, destinations, cool events, and places, and check out all the food, entertainment, and fun things to see and do, all right here on The Review. The Review is a show that will share experiences, sights, sounds, and the vibe on the scene as well as behind the scenes with interviews, music, and the people that we meet. We're sharing the story and appeal of those places to show you what they're all about. In this episode, we travel to the city of Aurora, Illinois to check out the sights and attractions as well as an in-depth look into their Paramount Theater and the city's artistic ambitions. Elle will bring you a piece of the new Jurassic World movie with behind the scenes, cast insight, and a look back at Andrew Lloyd Webber's show this past Easter. We were also hanging out at Uncle Stewie's Roadhouse in Spring Valley, Illinois, and have interviews with the owner and some talented artists. All this and more on this edition of The Review. Aurora, goddess of the dawn, established in 1837. Aurora's a happening city. We got a lot of stuff going on here. We got the great Paramount Theater, great Broadway shows. We've got a, a music venue that holds 10,000 people that people come to uh, throughout the summer. We have the longest riverfront in the state of Illinois, the Fox River, that runs through the heart of our city. Fittingly, the first campfire built on Stope Island in 1834 would come to mark where we now find downtown Aurora. The nickname City of Lights more than reflects its city's name. We claim to be the City of Lights and with good reason. Aurora, in its very early days, developed a, a way of lighting our streets with electric light. Aurora was one of the first in the United States to use electric lights for publicly lighting the entire city. Aurora is a, a town with a deep history. Aurora is primarily a river town. We're here on the Fox River. Much of the dynamics of Aurora's political, economic, and social history can be attributed to the combination of three factors historical industrialization, a sizable river that divides it, and the Burlington Railroad Shops, which were the town's biggest employer in the 1960s. In the mid-1830s, settlers came from the eastern part of the United States. There were stories that corn could grow 10 feet high and uh, more people started to come here. And I think one of the biggest factors in Aurora's development was the coming of the railroad. In 1855 and 1856, Aurora really started to boom because now you had the railroad and you had a big railroad industry. Only behind Chicago as the most populous city in the state of Illinois, Aurora isn't yeah. one to sit back and play second fiddle. What makes Aurora a unique place in the Midwest is its diversity. The heart of Aurora is our community. We're the most, one of the most multicultural mixed cities in the United States of America, in our whole country. Aurora had several waves of laborers who came in the 1850s, immediately following the arrival of the, of the railroad. They found in Aurora a place where they could actually have jobs, could build homes, build churches, schools. Ethnicity, this diversity has persisted in Aurora. White, black, Indian, Asian, Latino, we have the full gamut here and we celebrate each of the cultures. With an independent spirit, Aurora has an opera house, theaters, music halls, and blues clubs to bolster its strong arts and cultural scene. What isn't happening here in Aurora? That's the big question. I would say in the last five to 10 years, the culture and the arts has really just exploded. It's a true community feel. A key goal of the recently completed Downtown Aurora Master Plan is to revitalize the downtown. The downtown area is getting back to its roots as an entertainment center. A cornerstone of what Aurora has to offer, the Paramount Theater has already won 16 prestigious Jeff Awards in just three years. 
We have a bigger house than most New York Broadway houses. Actually, in some instances, double the size of the house. Paramount was called the showplace of the Fox River Valley. It opened in September of 1931, and immediately it was the place to come for your movie and uh, live entertainment. By the time the 70s rolled around, it needed a facelift, so they shut it down for a couple of years, they redid the whole theater, and they really restored it back to its original beauty, reopened it, and then kind of off we went. The theater introduced its Broadway series in 2011, and since then, over one million people have experienced the Paramount's grandeur. It all started with the Broadway season. Our CEO had this idea that, hey, we can't get really A-quality Broadway tours to come here, so if they don't come to us, we'll build it ourselves. So he literally went out and recruited this great artistic director, Jim Cordy, who's been on Broadway and won all these Jeff Awards and awards, and those guys got together and he started bringing in a new management team. And in seven years, we went from having zero subscribers to we have uh, 36, over 36,000 subscribers, which makes us the second largest musical subscription base in the United States. It's super cool because it's a relationship too between the city and us and arts organizations. First opened in 1931 and completely restored in 1978, the architectural design served as a prototype for Art Deco theaters throughout the country. Highlighting the city's cultural growth, the building next to the Paramount is being renovated into the Aurora's Arts Center, part of a $35 million project that will go even further towards setting Aurora apart. We're gonna open up uh, a School of the Performing Arts, so the John C. Dunham Aurora Arts Center and our School of the Performing Arts upstairs is actually gonna be rent-controlled apartments for artists. So if you work in any of the kind of arts whatsoever, you can apply to get in there. And then we have a full-on School of the Performing Arts. We're teaching music and dance, and you name it, we're gonna have it. The historical and aesthetic appeal the city has continued to develop, as well as helping to build a local arts network has created a haven for the arts community. Some say Aurora is currently in the midst of an arts, music, and cultural renaissance. All summer we have fests throughout the city. Not only do we have the River Edge Park, we have Jazz Fest, we have Summer Fest, we have a Wizard Fest or Magic Fest. We, we can't even have a list of events like on one sheet of paper because there's just so much going on downtown. We have the Fiesta's Patrias Fest, we have the Diwali Fest. Aurora Downtown Magic, uh, it's actually formerly the Harry Potter Festival. The Kids Fest. We have something called Roots Aurora, which is a multi-ethnic festival. The Food Truck Festival on May 4th this year. Downtown Alive is another exciting festival and River Edge Park has so much to offer. River Edge is super cool, man. We'd have everybody. We've had Kiss, which was a trip and a half. We've had Lady Annabellum, Peter Frampton and Steve Miller, Idina Menzel. The blues in particular come to life during the annual Blues on the Fox Festival. We've had all the blues legends, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Willie Nelson's Bender, Chris Kirstofferson. Matter of fact, this summer will be the first time we have a Fox Valley Foundation music venue right here in the city of Aurora. The Hollywood Casino brought an insurgence of development in the 90s and continued to attract people from all over. This city is packed with restaurants, attractions, and places to experience. Iconic to Aurora's history, Two Brothers Roundhouse, built in 1856, has a craft brewery, a cafe, and a music venue, all connected to Aurora's transportation center. The railroad shops lasted here in Aurora till 1974. Unfortunately, a lot of the buildings were demolished over the years, but we did save a couple. Today's transportation center on North Broadway was the old machine shops, and uh, what's known as Two Brothers Roundhouse today is the old railroad roundhouse that originates back to 1856. Leland Tower, a former hotel which was the tallest building in Illinois outside of Chicago, is on the National Register of Historic Places. When it was built, it was uh, 22 stories, the tallest building uh, in Illinois outside of the city of Chicago. For more international taste, Bally Doyle, an Irish pub, has a musical venue energy with food and drinks reminiscent of the motherland. Plus, there's Indiro, a Ugandan coffee shop and restaurant bound to attract those with eclectic taste. And of course, don't forget museums like SciTech, an Aurora Regional Fire Museum built from an old Aurora Fire Station.
With a scenic river and diverse population, a backdrop of re-energized iconic buildings, and a calendar full of events and activities, it is no wonder the area's art and culture are flourishing. Aurora is uh, a town that has a rich history and you can see it in museums, you see it in the architecture and in the beautiful downtown. Aurora is called the City of Lights. We're called the City of Lights because we were one of the first cities in the country to have electric street lamps. Now, Aurora is an entertainment hub. You know, from our Paramount Theater to our River Edge Park and all our fests, people want to be in Aurora. People want to come participate in our culture. It's turned into this really cool, thriving community that we're all involved in. I truly feel that there's just this palpable energy downtown right now, this renewal that's going to happen, and I'm really happy to be a part of it, and I think the people that we have in place right now are so passionate and caring about what's happening in Aurora that there's nothing that we can't accomplish throughout the next couple of years. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Remember that to love America is to love all Americans, because love has no labels. Welcome back. You're watching The Review. Four years after the Jurassic World theme park closed down, Owen and Claire returned to Isla Nubar to save the dinosaurs. Run! Run. Run, 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 run! 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 They learned that a once dormant volcano is active and could extinguish all life there. Along the way, Owen sets out to find Blue, his lead raptor, and discovers a conspiracy that could disrupt the natural order of the entire planet. We have an inside look at the new Jurassic movie with behind the scenes, interviews, and sneak peeks. Do you remember the first time you saw a dinosaur? For kids who grow up loving dinosaurs, the Jurassic movies are really the vehicle for them to see their dreams realized. You got that? That's awesome. <laughs> The Jurassic movies have always been suspenseful and exciting. We're telling the next chapter. This story takes dinosaurs and takes Jurassic where it's never gone before. We're literally blowing up the island. That's the scariest thing I've ever done. In this movie, we have a new director, Juan Antonio Bayona. I love playing with suspense. I like intensity, and I love to make the audience feel the total experience. He's genius when it comes to frightening people. <laughs> it's the T-Rex. It's the T-Rex. Stop! It's not T-Rex. <laughs> Be careful. There's dinosaurs everywhere, and they're flipping out and killing people. Let's go. It was important to us that the story be balanced on the characters, some of whom we know and some of whom we're just meeting. Jeff Goldblum, not gonna lie, that's pretty awesome. Here I am talking about dinosaurs again. In this Jurassic world, you will see more dinosaurs than you've ever seen before. <laughs> on this movie, we are dealing with real animatronic dinosaurs. It looks like a real dinosaur. I couldn't help but freak out the entire time. The challenge of making a sequel is finding the right balance between what people are expecting and what people would be surprised by. It's going to be intense and pretty spectacular. It's really good. That was my best acting. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. Yeah, man, it's Jurassic. This is going to be awesome. Keep an eye out for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom coming to theaters June 22, 2018. Uh, two, three, let's do it! They've been
been waiting for a second chance. Waiting for their country to need them again. That time is meow. Farga, can I get a radio check? <laughs> Love it. It's like we never left. It turns out the French-Canadian town, St. George du Laurent, is actually on American soil. You'll be phasing out a Canadian Mountie unit. Best behavior, boys. You guys ride horses, or? Yeah, this is in 1957. We drive Crown Victorias. Let's give a big Canadian welcome to the Vermont Highway Patrol. Come on, guys. They've come up here to tell us how great it's going to be for all of us to become Americans. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance yeah, to the flag. This is happening. Est-ce que vous savez à quelle vitesse vous allez? Do neither of you speak English? I do. We would like to eat your papers. Can you show me your party papers? This time everything will be by the book. Everything. What are you guys doing? Great Tim, Morgan's ghost. What can I get for you guys? Whole beer, liter of cola. What did you say? Do you want a liter of cola? Canada's pretty awesome. Boop, boop. Don't do that. Boop, 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 boop. Should I shoot him? Who? Papa? No! Jacques Grey pour Paul Marquis de Sartorette. Whoop! And they'll dust their croix, so les miserables, first catcher, Luke Robert, I doubt Daniel Perrier, Frank Tark, and Don Pinot, plus their parfait. Eau de toilette! Eau de doudade! Ça blague pour moi! I'm Eddie Turner, and you're watching the review. We're here at Stewie's Roadhouse checking out their Sunday entertainment. We'll be speaking with Craig Gertis, the country singer playing today, as well as Stewie himself. So let's head on in. Playing with Eddie Turner has been a real privilege for me. It's been kind of a blessing for old man, you know. Being a professional musician for 50 years, he brings so many things to the table, not just, you know, physically with his drums, but, you know, he brings a lot of heart, he brings a lot of spirit because he's seen it and done it with the best. It's rare that you get, you know, young people who realize, you know, what they're doing, where it comes from, and he knows where it comes from. I mean, you can see it in his face and, and you can hear it in his voice when he's singing. Means a lot. <laughs> Means a lot. Being from a family of musicians, my grandfather was very musical. He was always a singing Louis Armstrong and Frank Sinatra and the old crooners. Uh, my uncle is actually a musician uh, and a guitar player. He was played in a few bands when I was growing up. And uh, that's something I always wanted to do. I always wanted to play guitar just like he did. So playing at Stewie's is uh, actually really cool for me. And uh, when he finally asked me to, um, to play there, you know, it was, it was really big for me. It's just a cool bar in general, but it being, you know, very near and dear to me was, made it even better. Couldn't think of any better first way to do it than bring, you know, Eddie with me, and uh, we we did it. We we jammed out, and it was probably the best set I've had so far playing out. You know, meeting Marco now, he's a versatile enough guy where he does a little of everything, and you can hear it. You can hear it. I mean, he has a lot of potential. Y'all watch out for him. <laughs> Y'all watch out for him. Little brother coming at you, big time. Every time I practice is just get better than I was yesterday. You 
are a country singer, correct? I am a country singer. And correct me if I'm wrong, you started playing at 10 years old? I was 10, right? Yeah, I was with my dad's band. My dad was uh, a country music singer and songwriter and had his country band, and I started playing guitar in his country band when I was 10 years old. Not how I had things pictured. In a picture anymore. People call me outlaw, and I never call myself an outlaw <laughs> at whatsoever because when I think of outlaw, I think outlaw country in my mind is Johnny Paycheck and Waylon Jennings and stuff like that, and I never considered myself that. Uh, I consider myself more traditional country uh, with an outlaw flair, I guess, but I write and sing songs that were influenced by my country music heroes, which are Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings and Merle Hager and Johnny Paycheck and George Jones. Spring Valley's the best town for drinking. <laughs> I'm uh, sure each Illinois Valley town would argue that. <laughs> we come out of the womb knowing how to drink. Uh, it's, it's a great little town right on the river, July 1st. The town of Spring Valley works with me really good. And throw one of the biggest parties in the Illinois Valley right here in front of the bar. I have about seven, eight hours of live music right on the street. Vendors galore, food vendors, games for the kids. We do everything so the whole family can come out. All you gotta do is bring your lawn chair. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. And you're watching the review. The entire time I knew him, he only ever had one goal. To wipe out half the universe. If he gets all the Infinity Stones, he can do it with the snap of his fingers. Just like that. Tell me his name again. Thanos. One advantage. He's coming to us. We have what Thanos wants, so that's what we use. Let's talk about this plan of yours. I think it's good, except it sucks. So let me do the plan, and that way it might be really good. Wow. Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Then I am Spider-Man. I am actually a Bible scholar. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. I, I, I uh, go to Bible classes all the time. Jesus Christ Superstar is a 1970 rock opera with music by Andrew Lloyd Webber and lyrics by Tim Rice. Well, you know, it's a classic piece, of course, you know, and I was pretty sure they weren't going to cast me as Jesus. Uh, I'm always the villain, you know, the Alice Cooper character has always been the villain, so I was pretty sure I was going to either be Herod or Judas. The musical started off as a rock opera concept album before its Broadway debut in 1971. It has also been said it reinvented musical theater for the modern age. 
Last week, we brought you interviews with Glenn Close and Andrew Lloyd Webber talking about the live TV show that aired on Easter. The show was a hit with big names like John Legend and Alice Cooper, and according to The Hollywood Reporter, NBC's live telecast of the show averaged 9.4 million views. If you weren't one of those viewers, take a look at what you missed. Here we go, and roll playback. What an incredible honor to be cast as Jesus, but also to be part of this production. John is the perfect cast for Jesus because he has this ethereal quality to him also. In three days, I shall return. <laughs> this endeavor is unique. It's a Broadway show, it's a concert, it's a television show. It's kind of the best of all of these worlds. I'm so excited to work with the entire cast. We already have such a talented group with Sarah Bareilles. She has got the great voice. I don't know how to love him. I'm thrilled. I love this project. I love this score. I'm playing Mary Magdalene. She is a disciple, a believer, a friend, a confidant, a champion. The overall storyline of this show is the last week of Jesus's life through the lens of Judas. Judas loved Jesus and loved his message and was fighting to retain the integrity of the message and of this, his friend whom he cared about so much. It's the betrayal. It's the crucifixion. It's his relationship with Mary Magdalene. It's a roller coaster of emotions. I've been familiar with Jesus Christ Superstar, the show, since I was a teenager in high school. We sang some of the songs in show choir. The power of this production is that it talks about the human emotions that Jesus quite likely felt as he was about to be killed. This is absolutely one of the most classic shows of all time. Talk about timeless subject matter. It kind of has all this beautiful innocence and raw genius. That does look very impressive. Nobody writes a melody like Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber. He's one of a kind. I'm so glad that um, Andrew and Tim are, are blessing us with this great content and with their involvement in the show. He tries to work for what's new and what will resonate with the people who are going to see it now. I think it's, you know, just needs to settle a bit more so that the words can get over, you know? I think it's, it's at its best when it's as close to being a rock event or a rock concert as it can be. I'm excited for the challenge of doing this show live. Once you are going on that stage, that's it. It is one shot only. To do this show live on television, especially in front of a live audience, it's electric and thrilling. It is an epic journey to witness. You can still catch the replay on NBC's website or see it live and in person at the Lyric Opera in Chicago on April 27th. Check out their website at lyricopera.org for show dates. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. If you know of a fun or cool place that you think should be featured on the review, check out our website or our Facebook page. See you next week. Do you know of a fun place we could feature on our show? We're always open to new segment ideas and sponsorship opportunities. <laughs> visit our website or Facebook page. Visit our website. Visit our website or our Facebook page. Visit our website or Facebook page. <laughs> I know we're gonna be there someday. I'll fly and chase the big clouds away. I know I'll be there soon, oh, baby, be there soon. It seems as though the world these days is getting real tough. You have to put your foot down, just give yourself a bow. Oh, baby, be there soon. I know you want me with you, but this voice has got to hold on. Summer is right across.